A very good morning to all of you. Uh, let me thank Dinesh for those kind words. In fact, uh, the first day afternoon, when I was looking around, almost half the hall was filled with my students. So that is quite satisfying. So a teacher does get some satisfaction once in a while. <laughs> uh, let me begin by referring to uh, some, uh, you know, summing up that was done by Professor Ashok Patsarathy the first day. You know, the point that he made was that innovation is central to development. So you have to put that in that context. And now it's well known that growth and development depends to a large extent on efficient use of existing knowledge. That is, you know, innovation, social innovation as well as technological innovation. Mm -hmm. When we talk about social innovation, that's in innovation in the spheres of institutions, organizations, and governance. Now we have moved a long way from talking about technological innovation to social innovation. That's the frontier knowledge today. Let us recognize that. It is actually somewhat different from the technological innovation talked about for long. When we talk about social innovation, because if you recall the last two days discussion, quite a lot of it was technological innovation that was being talked about, not so much social innovation. So let me take you to a slightly different sort of area. And what is the focus of the presentation? Uh, well, you know, this doesn't re need any introduction. The finance growth relationship, by now it is fairly well accepted. And uh, the structure of the financial system is pivotal to growth. That's because what it does, the financial structure, is allocate resources to those sectors which are innovating and which are dynamic. That's why the financial sector is very, very important. That's why it's called the pivot of growth. And the focus of my presentation today is an institutional innovation in the financial system and its diffusion in India. Because, you see, we have been hearing about innovation, but very little on diffusion. If innovation has to have its impact on growth or development, more than the innovation, the diffusion has to be discussed in much greater, diffusion has to take place. Without that, you don't really see its impact in growth. And my focus is on an institutional innovation and its diffusion. And the institutional innovation I'm going to talk about is self-help groups, SAGs. And my argument is that the diffusion depends on certain preconditions. And if we ignore those preconditions, then we enter the danger zone. There's no point talking about innovation if you don't understand what preconditions lead to the diffusion of that innovation. Uh, now, when we talk about the financial system, especially banking, it largely works around collaterals. You see, when I talked about financial system allocating resources, what I was talking about was the credit. Now, in the banking sort of a system, credit works around collaterals. If you have a collateral, you can approach the banking system. If you don't have a collateral, there is simply no way you can approach the banks for a credit. Now, what it also means is that those without a collateral are just kept out of the system. Now, what the SAG as an institutional innovation did what to get over that collateral barrier. What is the collateral in the SAG? It is a group trust. So from a physical object or some other sort of an object, now it's just the group trust which becomes the collateral. Now that is the institutional innovation of the SAGs. Of course, in the South Asian context, you have two distinct origins. One is what is called the MFI model of Bangladesh. I'm not going to talk about that today. 
and the other is what we call the SAG bank linkage model, which is popular in India. Now, if you look at the SAG bank linkage, one of the early, of course, we have been having SAGs for a long time, but this SAG bank linkage, one of the early action research was, you know, in 1986-87, NABAD funded Mairada in Mysore on an action research project, and the results were simply beyond their expectations. The RBI, the Reserve Bank of India, was mighty impressed by the action research results, and then they gave assent to SAG Bank Linkage Program in 1991. That's how this SAG Bank Linkage Program begins in India. Of course, having said that, one should not forget the background. Uh, the background was that in 1969, you had the bank nationalization in India, and from 1970 onwards, you had a phenomenal expansion of bank branching across all the regions of India. So what happened was the very unequal distribution of bank branches increasingly got changed into more or less equal sort of a distribution. That's the important thing about the background following the bank nationalization. So one could visualize an all India SAG bank linkage program as part of the financial system. That's the importance of it. Now this initiative, the SBLP, has been with us for 20 years now. In fact, it's launched in 1992, what's called the pilot testing phase, 92 to 95, and then you have the mainstreaming phase, 96 to 98, and the expansion phase from 98 onwards. Now, if you look at the numbers, the SAGs credit linked by 2002 were less than half a million. But in the next year, 2003-04, it becomes 1 million, and then, you know, just the numbers just increase. 3.5 million by 2008. But interestingly, if you look at the regional distribution, the sh you know, share of South India, which accounted for only 20% of the Indian population, till 2001, the SAGs, number of SAGs banks linked, the share of South India was 71%. Of course, over the year years, it has come down slightly, but even now, it is about 50%. So, I would say, South India is the leader when it comes to SAG diffusion. This institutional innovation, diffusion of that, now South India leads. If you want the numbers, you know, I'm sorry, some of those are... Um, you just look at the, this is 2010 March, even now, close to 40% of all the bank-linked SAGs, the numbers, are concentrated in the southern region. That's quite a sizable proportion. You know, even after 20 years, this is the sort of a thing that you would find. And if you look at the share of South India in the savings, it's over 50%. More importantly, if you look at the share of the total credit, that bank credit advanced to the SAGs, the share of South India is close to two-thirds. Uh, and this is, of course, no, the, this is the number of, you know, SAGs availing, that is two-thirds. And if you look at the amount, it is three-fourths. That's the sort of a distribution that you have. Now, if you have that sort of a thing, in fact, the number of SAGs per thousand population or that sort of a thing must be pretty high in South India. What is that sort of a thing? You know, this is the sort of a picture that you get. Again, very, very striking. That is, uh, yeah. look at All India. It's about six SAGs per thousand population. Each SAG is about 15 members or that sort of a thing. So it's about 
six, less than six, all India level, but South India, it is thirteen per thousand population. Whereas you look at the other, you know, it's all very very, you know, some are just above the national average, but some are pretty low. That's the sort of a picture that you get. Now. Obviously, there is something quite specific to South India. That is what is leading to this sort of a thing. And what is it? I'll just give you a clue. I won't be able to answer that fully. The clue is here. If you look at the banking sort of a spread, you know, this is the number of deposit accounts per thousand population. As of 2009, you know, of course, this doesn't look all that high compared to the other regions, but still pretty high in the southern region. Okay, there's one slight problem here. That is because this is rural plus urban. If you separate it out and just do the rural, in fact, this becomes much more striking. More importantly, if you look at the number of credit accounts per thousand population, you just see, of course, there is some other western region also, but this is pretty high. In fact, more than double the other regions. So this is the sort of a banking history, the background. And the spread of bank branches itself, you don't have much of a difference across the regions. But the number of people using the banks, you see, it's much higher in the southern region. That is the background in which you introduce an institutional innovation. It just diffuses much more rapidly <clears throat> in the south compared to the other regions. Now, this raises a very important question. That is, if the SAGs are introduced, at least the ostensible purpose of this SAG bank linkage was to reach <coughs> credit, the bank credit to the poor. Poor and unbanked. If that is the sort of a thing, then one should look at that question given those numbers. In fact, what is happening is that you are not reaching it to the unbanked and the poorer regions. You are actually deepening it in the region where you already have a much better sort of a banking history and banking culture. That's the sort of a thing that's happening. So because South has a much better reach in terms of accounts, size of deposits and advances, and it has quickly taken to SAGs. The other regions, unfortunately, the diffusion has not been to that extent at all. That is, you know, 20 years after, a big boost was given to it. So what has helped South <coughs> is this long history of banking in South. <coughs> now, this is a subject, of course, I cannot go into any great detail here. Uh, there's a book of mine which has just come out, Rotledge India, called Shaping India. There is a chapter, a longest chapter on banking history in India, which would be a good you know, background to understand some of these things. Uh, now, if you look at the you know, long history and also the expansion post-bank nationalization, what you would see is that a government-led rapid expansion in other regions, not so much in South. That's what you find post-nationalization. But with that sort of a government-led expansion of banking, banking doesn't reach people so easily. You have the bank branches, but that in itself doesn't take people to the banks, or the banking culture just doesn't get developed overnight. Eh? Whereas mm -hmm. South was very different. Now, if you want that sort of a thing to happen, you require people's participation. And banking is a business of trust. So that needs to be strengthened. Just government-led expansion of banks or putting up a bank branch itself is not going to take banking to the people. Now that, if you want to build this business of trust, uh, that requires a probably a very different approach. With, with the trust, any institutional innovation in the banking thing, it takes roots very quickly. Without developing that, I think, and just having the bank branches is not going to 
achieve whatever you want to achieve. So that's what I call no trust, no banking, no SAG. Thank you.